hello and welcome to project noon a platform dedicated to critically and creatively exploring hindu muslim dialogue our guest today is professor ankur barua professor barua is university senior lecturer in hindu studies at cambridge university he read theology and religious studies at the faculty of divinity cambridge his primary research interests are vedantic hindu philosophical theology and indo islamic styles of sociality an important dimension is the comparative philosophy of religion he studies the theological and the socio political aspects of hindu christian engagements in recent years his research focus has moved to indo islamic theology and in particular to an exploration of the intersections between the idioms of bhakti yoga tauhid and tasawwuf on the multiply stratified post colonial landscapes of south asia professor barua recently uh, generously dedicated a song for project noon by the indo bengali poet shah abdul karim uh, and his uh, youtube channel is dedicated to more such poems and songs we have also published a short story by the professor on project noon entitled an island of remembrance that paints a portrait of a post partition hindu muslim encounter in an unlikely domestic space uh but our conversation today will be focused on his recent piece in renovatio the journal of zaituna college entitled images of the unimaginable god idols and what they signify in hindu traditions uh professor barua firstly thank you again for your generous time uh and what motivated you to write this piece for renovatio thank you for inviting me to speak to your forum and when i heard about your forum i was instantly motivated to reach out to you and let you know i would be very happy to to contribute in different ways to your forum because you right. know this uh is a much needed critical space for generating and fostering patterns of hindu muslim understanding now uh today we are going to talk about what i've said about the notion of idol worship or image worship in that article in renovatio but just to give you a general overview of what has been motivating me especially over the last 5 years 6 years uh to write articles books books even um on questions of hindu identity muslim identity hindu muslim uh, engagement so let's say for about you know the last four decades of my life i have directly lived with and known hindus muslims and christians and i in in one sense it, it is something so obvious to me that even when i begin to say it it seems so trivial but the fact that is that I have lived with and known Hindus, Muslims, and Christians before I started studying Hindu theology, Christian theology, and Muslim theology. In fact, I came to the theological study of religion or the philosophical study of religion pretty late in life and through a series of accidents. We won't go into that, say, at the age of eighteen or nineteen. But even before I picked up a book on Hindu theology or Islamic theology, I had and I have had Muslim friends, relatives, and acquaintances, and. when i was about 18 years old there was one thought that came to me that greatly distressed me and the thought was this that let's say to the average hindu now the phrase average hindu is a statistical construct there is no average hindu out there but let's say statistically there is somebody called the average hindu and the average hindu knows only two things about muslims in india south asia so number 1 Muslims are somehow directly or indirectly descended from bloodthirsty invaders from the northwest frontier from central asia or elsewhere and number 2 Muslims eat beef and this created a lot of distress to me because there's so 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 much more to the rich tapestries of islamic culture society theology mysticism and so on and this is just scratching the surface conversely the average muslim again a statistical construct there are no average muslims out there but the average muslim knows only two things about hindus number one hindus worship idols and hindus are polytheists and again that generated a lot of distress to me when i was around the age of 18 19 because to me this is again just touching the surface of such rich patterns of hindu thought experience subjectivity 
art, culture, poetry, music, singing, and all of that. And for various reasons, I moved into Hindu Christian comparative theology. Around five years ago, when I was uh, reading some of the Bengali writings of the Bengali poet thinker Rabindranath Tagore, and this was an article I meant to check the date of the composition of the article, but I did not. But let's say roughly 1923, just to make it slightly uh, dramatic, exactly 100 years ago, here is Tagore writing a short essay on Hindu-Muslim relations, and he complains, pretty much articulating, echoing my own sense of distress. He says that Hindus and Muslims have been living in the land of Bengal for so, so, so many centuries, but they are separated by this vast gulf. Although he does not use the precise terminology that I use, say Muslims as invaders and Hindus as polytheists, he was arguing the same point and I was deeply struck by it. He said, look, in 1923, this is what he was arguing and this is what I felt when I was about 18 years old and here I am in 2018 uh, retracing some of those thoughts in my mind like re-echoing some of those thoughts in my mind and then some of this sense of disquiet this sense of distress generated um, partly this is one of the many reasons why I wrote the book the Hindu self and his Muslim neighbors and then I thought well at the end of the day this is an academic monograph uh, number one, it is very highly prized. Who has the money to buy these kinds of academic monographs? Number two, they will be lying in some dusty corner of a library somewhere out there. And for better or worse, it's an academic monograph which is written in a slightly technical style. I wanted to start writing something, uh, certain essays, articles, where I could communicate the essence, the quintessence of my arguments in that book and, and in some other articles in a way that would be accessible to people without any kind of academic scholarly training. And so that is partly what was motivating that short story you indicated, partly what has motivated some of the other uh, blog essays that I've written and my YouTube channel. Now, this question, uh, what is idol worship? What is an image? What is an idol in a Hindu context? As I say, the average Muslim will associate straight away with Hinduism. If you go and say, what is Hinduism? Who are Hindus? idol worshippers. So I wanted to write something in a way that would be accessible even to a Muslim who has never heard the word V-E-D-A made up. Right? Now, whether or not I've succeeded in that attempt, I don't know, it's for you as the reader to tell me. That was my, so that is just an initial overview of what motivates me to to projects like Project Noon, generally speaking, and to writing essays and articles on these kinds of topics. So, so I will, I will, uh, I will stop there. Right. And and I suppose some of my more concrete answers to specific topics, uh, you can see how they are to be situated against this backdrop of what is bringing me here. Right, right. No, uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, well. Uh, in my own uh, various conversations on uh, Hindu-Muslim relations and mutual understanding, so uh, the issue of idolatry seems to be at the center of, uh, particularly from the Muslim point of view, because it's a it's a it's a big roadblock if you cannot look past that or or look through it basically to understand the motivations from the Hindu point of view for what they're doing. Uh, and we'll, uh, in the later part of our conversation, we'll touch upon why the term idolatry itself might be problematic. Because again, uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not a term which anyone would like to use for themselves. It's only a term which is given by others to, uh, to them. So uh, that is, uh, a, I mean, a question in itself. Uh, but before we actually get to the uh, specific form forms of idolatry or you know forms of image worship or iconography uh what I, I suppose is a more even more fundamental question is uh this reality the transcendent reality that which is beyond is being represented here in so many different forms uh the most fundamental question is this that how can something which is formless or eternal or infinite or beyond everything uh, how can that be captured into any form or into any representation, be it abstract or visual? Because everyone makes a form of God. Uh, I mean, even um, so-called iconoclasts also have an abstract imagery of God. 
where you imagine God's God seeing and God hearing because these are all part of the Quranic description of God as well. So, uh, uh, I mean, just, you know, uh, in brief, uh, I suppose that's the fundamental dilemma at the heart of these traditions. Yeah, I'm I'm happy you, you used the word dilemma because the word I would have used as paradox, which are very similar terms. So what we have to keep right. in mind is that right. all these different Hindu traditions and Islamic and Christian traditions too, but let's not make a comparative remark yet, are struggling with this deep dialectic, deep dilemma, deep paradox of trying to express or indicate or point towards the formless by using the language of forms, right? So even if I say something like, Towards God, I can only point the finger at. It is still a form, namely the finger I'm pointing at, right? Now, mm -hmm. you use these two big terms, transcendence and immanence, and it's very important to, I would say, to understand these terms properly. Often these two terms, transcendence and immanence, are viewed as contradictories or as polar opposites. And this is how we think. We think that God is transcendent to the world in the same way that the planet Jupiter is transcendent to Earth. So I can, if you ask me, where is Jupiter? Is Jupiter in this room? Is Jupiter immanent in this room? No, Jupiter is transcendent to this room and I point at Jupiter. You know? Now that is possible only because Jupiter is a finite object, has a specific spatio-temporal limitation. And I can say here are the spatio-temporal coordinates of Jupiter. But if I could point, possibly point to God in that way by saying out there, that thing in the garden or that thing on the other end at the remote end of the Milky Way is God. What have I done? Even without realizing it, I have reduced God into a finite object. So God is that unique point of intersection where transcendence and immanence are not opposed, but mutually congruent. Now, here's one more example. Am I immanent to this room right now the office where i'm sitting yes am i transcendent to this room right now no and that is because i'm a finite being i cannot be simultaneously at every moment in time be transcendent and immanent to each special temporal location but god let's say god only knows how in some way mysterious way that our finite human minds cannot comprehend or grasp or apprehend and if you want to call it the mystery of creation or the mystery of being you may use that language God is uniquely immanent in this room right now. And to use the language of the Quran, God is closer to me than my jugular vein. And similar language can be found from the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Vedantic texts. God is in the cave of the heart, by which I don't mean my physical heart. It's a symbolic way of saying God is so deeply suffusing, structuring, shaping my existence, that if God were to remove the divine presence from my being, I would collapse into nothingness straight away. So in that sense, God is in the cave of my heart, but doesn't mean that I have somehow put God into my pocket. Of course not. God is also transcendence. God is also transcendent. And that is that unique combination, this paradoxical point of intersection between transcendence and immanence. It's just one definition of God. If you ask me to define God, say, what is God? I will say that unique point of intersection where transcendence and immanence are not opposed, but mutually congruent is God. And how is it possible? As I said, God only knows. And what Hindu traditions are trying to do in one way or the other, in forming images, using images made of brick, stone, mud, earth, and, and various other elements like steel and so on, on, they are not trying to say that if I construct an image of Krishna or Rama or Shiva, say this is an image of Krishna, I somehow squeeze the transcendent God, the formless God, into an object which is 10 inches tall. Right. By, by, by definition, that attempt is doomed to fail. So theological texts and commentarial passages will routinely remind you with various kinds of caveats that do not conflate, to use two words in English, do not conflate the icon or the image with the deity. So somehow Krishna is fully present in the date, in the image in front of you, and yet Krishna is not just the image full stop, right? So this kind of paradoxical tension between saying it is Krishna whom you are worshipping through the image, and it's not some prime minister of Australia or the planet Pluto. It is the divine presence of Krishna who is immanent in the image, and Krishna is not the image full stop, right? So, so 
trying to hold together in a creative tension these two different uh, threads of transcendence and immanence and holding them together because, as I said, they are uniquely somehow, God only knows how, combined in the image. And that is the, I mean, I mean, let's not go too far yet, but just, just to carry on from there, that is the meaning of this very uh, uh, troublesome and misleading phrase, phrase uh, image worship. Because when you hear the term image worship or murti puja in say Bengali or Hindi, you may think that 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 particular finite object, five feet tall or something like that, is being worshipped. So again, we can play with concepts and say the image is being, let's say, venerated, uh, somewhat in parallel with the Roman Catholic practice of venerating saints. You don't worship saints, you venerate them, and you venerate them in the name of the one true God, let's say, in this case, Jesus Christ, the, the, the second person of the Holy Undivided Trinity. That's the... Catholic language. So in this case, too, the the images, generally speaking, I mean, you know, I, I mean, depending on the Hindu sampradaya or tradition we are looking at, the answer will have some variations. But here's an overview, general answer that images are venerated, not worshipped. God alone is the recipient of all true human worship and adoration. But the image can be a channel pointing towards that one true God. So, so these are my initial comments for now. I mean, let's not go too far. Uh, yeah. Right, right. No, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, well, yes. Uh, I mean, all this discussion also turns on the question of how we define worship, and where, uh, what is the you know fine line between veneration and worship? And I mean, that's a that's a whole. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's depends on how you would like to define those categories. Yes. Uh, which is not, uh, I suppose, as clear cut as we would like to assume, because even in the Islamic tradition itself, we have things such as uh, I mean, the quintessential, um, you know, act of worship is the prostration, the sajda in Islam, right? Before God, you're supposed to be in the sajda, you're the closest you can be to God in that moment. Uh, but we also find instances in the Quran where the sajda is done uh, by angels to Adam, firstly, in the story of creation, uh, and not to God. Uh, and also in Joseph's story, by his family, to, to Joseph. So his brothers and his father, they prostrate to him. Uh, so in even though in Islamic fiqh it is prohibited, I suppose, in, in one sense to uh, prostrate to other human beings, uh, but it, it has been recognized that in the uh, in, in different times and different places, these practices were allowed and this uh, this was how it was done. And and so then there was this distinction between veneration and worship. Uh, so uh, it's a very interesting, uh, yeah. you know, Tangent, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, again, in some of the Hindu traditions that I'm thinking of as I'm hearing you talk about sajda and ibadat and such terms, um, on the one hand, there is this kind of fine-grained continuum in Hindu traditions as well between some understanding of humanity and some understanding of divinity, which allows some Hindus to discern the presence of the divine in various natural entities, like say the river, uh, Ganga to start with, the mountains, the Himalayas, in certain saints or sages or sadhus. At the same time, there are also, as I said, these kinds of cautionary reminders that do not think that the fullness of the formless divine beyond space and time has somehow become bound, constricted to this limited form. Because one, fundamental paradigmatic uh, statement that you find again and again in various forms of Hindu philosophy, Hindu theology is this, that the ultimate divine reality, Atman or Brahman, cannot be subject to any form of samsaric distress, Dukkha. So samsara is this cycle of impermanence, sorrow, suffering, ignorance, all of this. And no kind of contamination of this absolute purity of Brahman with any form of samsaric distress is to be is allowed, is prohibited very strictly. And even when, therefore, Hindus may claim to discern a divine, quasi-divine, semi-divine presence in the banyan tree or in the river or in the fields, what is operative in the backdrop is this prohibition. That that do you mean to say that Brahman has become the field as now is generating all the all the crops? Do you mean to say that Brahman has become bound to the cycle of rebirth, reincarnation, suffering, ignorance? No, right? So, so 
So, 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 so once again, uh, to go back to what I was saying in my previous response, the, these two theological strands, they kind of pull apart. So on the one hand, trying to emphasize that it is the productivity of Brahman, which you see in the crops. On the other hand, trying to distance Brahman from the suffering, which is associated with samsara. And the great theological task in many Hindu systems is to how to marry them together, how to weave together, how to interweave these two threads, which are seemingly pulling apart. Is Brahman in the rice field? Yes. Is Brahman in the rice field? No. And you can affirm both the affirmative and the negative in the same breath. Yes, no is the answer. Right, right. Right. And of course, um, um, uh, I mean, there are equivalents of these, um, this polarity of the divine nature, I suppose, yeah. uh, in uh, various Abrahamic uh, traditions as well, the transcendence and immanence, or uh, in Arabic, what is known as Tanzi and Tashbi, uh, uh, where, which is, which is you know, uh, beautifully encapsulated in that one verse in the Quran, which says that there's nothing like him. And he is, I mean, the, this is the first part of the verse. The second part continues. There's nothing like him. And he is the all hearing, the all seeing. Uh, or the all knowing so knowledge and hearing or listening or knowing i mean these are again uh, on the on the first part you uh, emphasize the dissimilarity of god from all you know human attributes and then you ascribe certain human attributes to him because without that i suppose uh, without some kind of um, similarity or some kind of uh, uh, human um, uh, i mean using our human faculties as a metaphor to understand the divine we wouldn't be it would be impossible to know anything about him or to have any relationship with with the beyond yes right yeah no that's right i mean right. it's very good that you raise this notion of polarity between uh tanji and tasbi say right. does god allah really sit on a throne or not there are all kinds of answers possible one is no it's just a symbolic allegorical way of saying one way could be no there really is a throne and one, a third way could be God only knows how. I mean, there really is a throne, but not a human throne. And God does sit on that not human throne and God only knows how, right? So oh, so many different permutations and combinations are possible even within an Islamic context. I'm not even talking about Murti and image in a Hindu context. Right. And although in this particular essay, I, I don't make any extensive Hindu-Muslim, Indo-Islamic right. comparative remarks. I mean, there is one paragraph where I highlight some, some such engagements. Uh, some of these perplexities, dilemmas, polarities, complexities in the Islamic traditions too are what I had in mind, although I was not directly engaging with them or responding mm -hmm. with them. I was hoping that some of my Muslim audiences would say, okay, I mean, I'm not now a specialist in Hinduism, but what this guy is saying does remind me of this medieval pre-modern debate between these two theologians in Baghdad in the 14th century. Or this great debate that happened in Lucknow in 1852 between this person and that person about these questions regarding um, does God sit on a throne and what kind of a throne is that? Is it made of gold? Is it made of kind of divine stuff that I do not comprehend? Right. So this is the perennial, perennial in one sense, a uh, struggle of trying to express the formless, trying to indicate the formless, trying to gesture towards the formless by using human form. Because what else will we do? Because we human beings are where we are, namely form the beings. I mean, if we were angels, we would not even have this discussion, right? I mean, we would have some kind of a right. non spatial temporally located maybe intellect, and we would just kind of know know the angels or know even God maybe to some extent. But for better or worse, we have a form and we have to start with where we are, namely form. And to try to get out of our skins and say, okay, I will aim at a formless vision is I would say humanly impossible. We just have to start from where we are, namely form. The question is what status you assign to form, how significant you think form is. Is form dialectically interrelated with the mm -hmm. formless? Is form a pathway to the formless? Or is form something that is completely corrupted and corruptible and has to be thrown away straight away, right? So the question is not whether form, mm -hmm. the question is what to do with form. Right, right. Right, and what, what does form represent for you? Right. Yeah. 
So that that is again another question, is it not? By form, do mm. I mean or right. do I mean iconographic form? Or as you were pointing out earlier, is a say for example, to put the question very bluntly, Allah God has 99 names. Are those 99 names forms? I could come up with a definition of form such right. that even a name is a form, and even that would become a form of idolatry. One should say one should not even use any right. name because the name is already a form according to my definition of form. So that raises the meta right. question: right. What is a form in the first place? Then, right. Well, I mean, it is it is at least a conceptual form, yeah. if not a visual form. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. And and when I say form, I just mean form. I have not defined form in any way. Whether <laughs> form has a material. Right embodiment or an iconographic correlate. I mean, we have not yet gone there. I'm just using the English word form or the Sanskrit word rupa, and I'm sure you can find words in Arabic and Persian for that. So whether it is a mental visual presentation or a graven image, which is prohibited, say made with hands and made with uh, a clay and wood and stone, or whether it is a calligraphic form, a beautiful calligraphic depiction of a surah or from the uh, from the Quran, or or let's say beautiful calligraphic invocation of of a Hindu god, right? So so is that a form or not? Um, in a very, if you apply a very stringent definition of form, then even talking about God will become impossible because what is language? Language is sonic form. Right. Language is a language itself. Right. Just language called English that I'm using to talk to you now, or Hindi, or Urdu, or Bengali, or any North Indian language. These are forms made with sound, with human, these are sonic representations. So even talk about right. God will become impossible if you take, as I said, maintain a very stringent uh, criterion of mm. not use form to talk about the forms. Right? No painting will be possible, no calligraphy will be possible, uh, no construction of temples and mosques will be possible, no architecture, no music. You know, that's why, as you know, I mean, right. many. Islamic context, the status of music is deeply disputed, right? Whether you can or cannot use the music in talking about God. So I would say the real debate is not right. whether Hindus are idol worshippers or not. The real debate is the meta question. What is an idol in the first place? Have we gone mm. to the drawing board and arrived at some kind of mm. consensus? I say some kind of consensus because, you know, human beings don't agree on pretty much everything. But if we can have some kind of consensus that if you cross that line, I won't call it an idol. And if you do not cross that line, I will call it an idol. Um, let alone Muslims and Hindus. Muslims, Christians, and Jews have not been able to answer this question for, what, 2,000 years now? Right. right. I mean, right. So right. it is very much an ongoing debate, even, I highlight, the even within so-called Abrahamic context. It's not that right. Jews, Muslims, and Christians have figured out the answer, okay, this is an idol. And when we approach the Hindus as one block, okay, you better accept my definition of an idol. What was that? What is the definition of an idol in the Abrahamic context? Right? There's no one fixed understanding. It varies. And that is what I mean, that the, the meta question is the one that, in my estimate, is even more important than the subsequent question. This particular Hindu Sampradaya tradition's understanding of the divine, is it or is it not image worship or idol worship? That will come later. We should have some measure of consensus on what, what is a meaningful criterion to use when we say this is veneration and not worship or this is worship and not veneration and all these different concepts in my mind. But that's partly because I'm at the end of the day a philosopher. I work with concepts and I, and I like to see some kind of conceptual understanding worked out, not necessarily before we study things, but alongside studying lived phenomena. Right? So... So, so anyway, these are my right. thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. There's a there's an important point there about uh, if you're just looking at it from a Muslim point of view itself, uh, the uh, any conceptualization of God is by definition a limited conception. Uh, because God is, we believe, always beyond whatever we can imagine of him, even our highest imaginations. Indeed. So every conceptual form or every conceptual or every imaginative, everything that we can imagine is itself an idol in that sense, because it represents God only in a limited way. So uh, creating idols, be it of forms or of, of a physical idol or a mental idol, 
it's perhaps a human inevitability and there's no way going around it it's a uh, it's it's a part of the uh, the limitation of the relationship between god and man but from the point of view of man from from the point of view of human beings uh, this is uh, i mean perhaps in that sense in that fundamental sense there's no escape from representing god in our own limited ways because we are limited beings right yeah, indeed. I mean, that's well, what I was trying uh, to indicate when I said, right, yes. you know, when I was trying to indicate that we should not apologize too much for having to use forms. It right. is part of the human condition. Right. We are not infinite. We are finite. So one right. aspect of our finitude is that we use forms to communicate, right? To communicate, right. to convey information, including who we think God is. The only pathway that is accessible to us is the pathway of form. I mean, if we could, by definition, become right. formless, we will become God, full stop. We don't need to have this conversation. Right, 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 right. Now, uh, I mean, coming back to the uh, particular forms of uh, Hindu worship and trying to understand them, I mean, uh, with this in in mind, with this you know fundamental premise in mind. Hmm. Uh, what is the uh, I mean, what is the Hindu or I suppose what are the plural Hindu uh, theological uh, self understandings of these image worship practices? Yeah. So uh, let me begin with a kind of a blanket overview remark, which I always make when I talk about Hinduism that we should understand the term Hinduism in the plural as Hinduisms. And now right. we just have a term right. called Hinduism and we use it. Even I use it. You know, I say I teach Hinduism. But if you look at my research, nowhere do I work on Hinduism. I, I work on one particular tradition mm -hmm. on one particular text or one particular historical era. So think of Hinduism in two ways, in a cultural, social way, in a civilizational way, and in a more specific religious way. Now, these two ways are, of course, very deeply interrelated. It's a conceptual distinction. So Hinduism, understood as a civilization, as a way of life, if you want to put it that way, as a cultural formation, as a social development, we use the term Hindu or Hinduism to refer to various developments, processes, ideas, institutions that have been developing on the landmass that we today call South Asia for about 3,000 years. 2000 years, so say at the very least 1500, 1200 BCE to today, right? So this is the geographical, cultural, ethnic even understanding of the term Hindu or Hinduism. A more specific religious theological way of understanding Hinduism is to talk about texts like the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavata Purana, multiple commentarial, exegetical commentarial treatises on these scriptural root verses. Now, the cultural meaning of Hinduism and the religious meaning of Hinduism are, are, of course, very deeply interrelated. Some Hindus are both culturally Hindu and religiously Hindu. Some people could say, I'm culturally Hindu. I get married according to the Hindu custom or cremated and not buried, but I do not have any particular religious, theological um, you know, beliefs or presuppositions. That is just to keep this point, you know, I mean, throw out this point out there that, that when we talk about Hinduisms, uh, we should not be looking for the Hindu ans answer to the image or the Hindu answer to the meaning of life or the Hindu answer to who is God or the Hindu understanding of what is the best way to live my life or what promotes Hindu well-being or flourishing. Right? So that brings me to your question in particular. Therefore, we should not be surprised that when it comes to the question of murti or image or icon or idol, and what is the status of the idol? What is the significance of the idol in apprehending the formless divine? We should not be surprised that there is a vast range of answers to this question. And um, before I get there, here is just something I something that comes to my mind straight away. Uh, before I published this book, uh, The Hindu Self and His Muslim Neighbors, I published a book called the Brahma Samaj and his Vaishnava milieus, and we'll come to the Brahma Samaj again when we talk about the Ramohan Roy. And there in the appendix, yes. I translate from Bengali four major chunks of text, Bengali to English. And I think this is appendix B. I translate a work uh, published by, I forget the name of the gentleman, 
1901. And, and it's a long treatise, uh, quite repetitive. But the reason why I publish it is because this is possibly the best Hindu critique I have read of the notion of the idol. And this person is a Hindu. You know, and I was like, okay, one day some Muslim or some Christian theologian will read my appendix B. And they were like, okay, let's see if I can do it better. So, so as, as will become clear as we go on, in fact, I myself think that this critique of the idol um, it's not quite accurate because that's not how some other Hindus will understand the idol. But but this is just to show you right. what I mean by the wide diversity of Hindu views, presuppositions about the meaning of the idol. This is a strict, proper, fairly proper Hindu reflection going back to the Upanishads on why Hindus should not worship, quote unquote, the idol, as this person understands what the idol is. Okay. Now to give you some more context to what, what this episode is about, Say, um, we don't quite know, at least I don't quite know, because I'm not an archaeologist, uh, exactly when Hindu temples, Hindu idols, images began to appear in South Asia. Some people date it at the turn of the first millennium. Some people may push it even backwards to about 400, 300 BCE. So let's say images, idols, icons, whatever word you want to use, and temples have been around us for 2,000 years, maybe. Now, um, as these uh, practices of worshiping God with an image, through an image, alongside an image were developing, these practices were developing against the backdrop of the Upanishads. And Upanishads are viewed as fundamental revelation, Shabda, Shabda Pramana, to use the Sanskrit term, for all these uh, Hindu traditions. And the Upanishads are not what we may call a doctrinal theology. By doctrinal theology, I mean a worked out, fully fleshed out doctrinal understanding of who God is, what the world is, who human beings are, what is the relation between humanity and divinity, the relation between humanity and the natural world, you know, the kind of doctrinal treatise you may read from a Sufi theologian or a Hindu theologian or a Christian theologian. The Upanishads are not quite theology in that sense. The Upanishads are a collection of aphorisms, phrases, sentences, verses, dialogues between gurus and disciples, some possibly historical incidents as well thrown in. And there are some verses in the Upanishads which, on the face of it, very clearly say that any attempt to use form like quasi form, uh, quasi formed entities is preliminary, is penultimate. And the recurring uh, motif, which is found in one Upanishad and which is used subsequently, is neti neti, not this, not this. So it is this via negativa, the, the method of negation. So God is not a laptop, not this conversation, not a camel, not a cow, not a, a goat, not a mountain, dot, dot, dot. You carry on with this long, infinite, in potentiality, a series of negative disclaimers. And there are also uh, verses, including one which I quote in the essay itself, which says God is not this, God, is, God does not have this, God does not have that, God does not have that, right? So as the taste in Hindu traditions were developing, again, possibly around the turn of the first millennium, what we call Vaishnavism, the worship of Vishnu as the supreme abode, the supreme origin, the supreme goal of all humanity, Shaivism, worshipping Shiva as the supreme destiny of all humanity, the supreme goal, or forms of Krishna worship were developing, they had to contend with these kinds of scriptural statements, which on the face of it, as I say, straight away say, straight away negate, any use of form or formed entities in approaching God. So these traditions, they coexisted and they coexist with these kinds of Upanishadic statements and they read these statements in a certain way. What they say these Upanishad state, Upanishadic statements mean is not the negation of all forms full stop to God. The negation of the human imperfections which are associated with form. So if I look at an image of Krishna, what do I see? A four-limbed human being-like being. And that is how I see, because I'm a finite human being who sees, let's say, human beings everywhere. But when you see the form of Krishna with two limbs, you are supposed to keep in mind that this is some kind of supernatural form, which is appearing in this form, which is gracious, which is smiling, which is benevolent. Because if Krishna were to appear in some terrifying form, you will run away, let's say, and you will not be able to generate a bhakti or devotional love towards Krishna. So even though the form looks human to you, semi-human, it is not human full stop. 
So you can see how these Hindu traditions, they carry, they embody this deep conceptual scriptural tension between, on the one hand, saying that God has some kind of form. They have their own theological reasons for why God has a form. With the scriptural negation from the Upanishad, God has no form, right? So on the one hand, there's one strand of Hindu scripture saying God has form, go to the temple, have a darshan, have an image, have a vision, and offer some fruit or some water or some flowers, which will be touched, radiated by divine presence, and you consume them. But did you forget the Upanishads? No, we did not. Because when I say I saw God, I did not mean to say I saw a human being like you. I saw some kind of divine presence in a human form. And, and the reason why I put it tentatively like that, because you know, that, that is the struggle. That is the struggle that they're trying to work through. God having a form, but not a human form. And, and yet it is like a human form. I mean, I can say more, right. but maybe I should stop. For now here right yeah right yes uh, right so yeah. right i mean yeah i mean that, that, that's very interesting and in the article itself you uh cite two incidents of uh, uh one i mean of you know involving shri krishna one as an infant and one in the you know battlefield of kuru Indeed. as an infant of course uh, uh his mother uh, Yashoda sees within him, within his mouth, the entire universe or the entire cosmos and, you know, all these realities and herself even. And then, at, at, I mean, another instance, you have uh, Arjuna in the battlefield of Kuru asking Krishna to, to show him as himself, you know, in, in all his reality. And uh, I mean, I mean, in, in, in both these instances, Krishna is both the infant and the divine and both the cousin and the, you know, uh, charioteer and the divine, right? So I mean, this tension is both, I mean, involved in both these places. Right? Yeah. This tension that you point out, uh, yes. Mother Yashoda looking into the mouth of the, the tiny mouth of the infant Krishna and seeing how the finite baby enfolds and encapsulates a whole infinity of worlds is what I was trying to get at earlier when I said uh, the image or God is the paradoxical point of intersection between transcendence and immanence. When you look at a finite object, you see that the seemingly finite object contains an infinity of worlds within it. And this is this mystical vision, if you will. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, if I say, okay, here is my cell phone. And if you ask me, do you feel, see the presence of God in the cell phone. Suppose I'm the kind of theologian who says, oh, what does a cell phone have to do with God? God is like grand matters. If you go to a temple, if you go on a pilgrimage, that is real God. God has nothing to do with such a mundane, petty little thing. But the moment I argue like this, I'm setting up an artificial distinction between two doctrines. One is divine monotheism and the other is divine omnipresence. So if God is absolutely one, God has to be present in everything, including, I should say, especially the cell phone. So to say that God is somehow not present in the cell phone, but God is present in a temple or elsewhere or in a mosque or a church, I'm setting up at this bifurcation between divine monotheism and divine omnipresence. Whereas these two teachings or notions or doctrines are two sides of the same coin. And God is absolutely one. God has, by definition, to be present in everything, including the laptop, including the cell phone. So... This is what is being articulated right. through this parable of a mother looking into the mouth of her infant. And the mother may say, oh, this is just an infant. What does God have to do with it? But that, that is like a salutary message to us that do not think of anything to be so mundane, so petty, that God has nothing to do with it. God is there because God is omnipresent, including there. Right. 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 And I mean, it, it, in one sense, this you know, vision of Advaita, of the, of non-duality and, you know, uh, Brahman or the the absolute being. Uh, uh, I mean, it converges all this multiplicity into a single point and saying that, uh, I mean, in fact, I mean, it might seem outwardly that what you're saying is that there are, I mean, God has so many different forms, but it is all because God is the only or the, or the only substance or the only reality that that is that is real and that is uh, that is absolute. Yeah. So everything else that we see are but forms or emanations of this reality and different manifestations of it. Right. 
या इंजिन राइट आई मीन सो दैट मीन दिस इज इन प्रिंसिपल और यू नो राइट आई मीन आई मीन दिस इज व्हाट आई वाज सेइंग इज दैट आई मीन दिस इज रादर देन अ अ पॉइंट व्हिच एम्फसाइजेस द यू नो मल्टीपल फॉर्म्स ऑफ गॉड आई मीन दिस डॉक्ट्रिन इज ब्रिंगिंग इट ऑल बैक टू द एब्सोल्यूट वननेस ऑफ गॉड इन वन सेंस आई मीन सो आई मीन फ्रॉम एन इस्लामिक पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू दैट्स दैट्स अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग आइडिया yeah right. no that's what i meant when i say divine omnipresence seeing god in everything and divine monotheism are two right. sides of the same coin that if i claim not to feel the presence right. of god in the sky what am i denying i'm denying divine monotheism because i'm saying i found i've located this special temporal zone where god does not exist there's somebody else there in the sky that don't mean i have to worship the sky as god my point is that's why i right. use the position in that somehow right. i don't know how god is present in the sky and where does it follow from from divine monotheism if god is absolutely ultimately one then i cannot deny the divine presence anywhere what i do with the divine presence that i feel right. is another matter i mean whether i venerate it or whether i don't do anything right. or whether i write a poem or sing a song about it or i give a lecture on it that's a subsequent question what to do with this presence but i cannot deny the divine presence in anything and in one sense this is just what is called polytheism although in a negative way from say abrahamic perspective when so you say oh hindus go around worshiping multiple gods what i'm showing is that this so called hindu polytheism is a logical implication of divine monotheism if god is absolutely one you cannot not see god in everything right right and that right. is what others yeah. call polytheism let me uh, it's it... right right uh, and of course i mean there are also very interesting um uh you know inflections of this doctrine in muslim theology as well uh, particularly particularly in sufism where the kalima la ilaha illallah no god but god is also extended to mean uh, there is no reality but god so the absolute reality is god and everything else is but contingent reality and uh uh which is of course uh, the um, school of ibn arabi and um, the you know school of wahdat al wujud is uh, i mean in that sense it is very uh, of course I mean, similar to the advaita view of uh, you know thinking about god yeah. yeah and 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 even people who have but, uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a whole i mean tangent in itself and we won't yeah. have to go there yeah, yeah, yeah. no but so, but i mean e- even without going there and even people who have never yes. heard of advaita and ibn arabi and sufism you know they would right. be familiar by people i mean people in india would be familiar with this right. through that bollywood song uh, kun faya kun right when there was nothing there was god i don't i can't remember which movie it is from kun faya kun ranveer hmm. kapoor i think right ha huh. Star and rock star, I think so. Oh, sorry, right. rock star. Yes, that one. Right, Kun Fayyad Khan. Where the song is being sung in uh, yes, yeah, Nizamuddin Darga. When there was yes, um, there was nothing there. Right, it was still right. gone. Hmm. Right. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so 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 the some yes. Some, uh, well, I mean the the some and some of the. I mean, the the the, the sum and substance of what I'm saying on so far is simply a very simple point that so-called Hindu polytheism is somewhat paradoxically a logical implication of divine monotheism. So I'm even claiming that polytheism mm-hmm. and divine monotheism are not right. opposed. If you believe that God is absolutely one, you cannot not feel the presence of God in this laptop. Now, mm-hmm. how you read that in is up to you. That's for the theologians to right. come in and say. okay not too much in a little bit out or not too much out right. a little bit in we can work out the details and we will possibly not agree because you know that's mm. what we have been doing theologians for 2000 years but the 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 uh, right. the struggle is to do this to say that if i believe in the absolute unity of god i cannot not see god everywhere right yeah. right of course yeah. right i mean uh, the the um um flip side of that or the the opposite you know t- taking the opposite opposite side would be to say that uh, the world or you know other things have independent existence apart from god yeah. so i mean that is uh, you know uh, a greater statement of you know polytheism if you're 
if you're concerned than to say that uh, things are everything is dependent on god or is yeah. uh, you know uh, has god as its only source right that you're right yeah um, that, that's a very good, I mean, very subtle and just very one or two point. more interesting yes uh, yeah. yes that's, so the world is a dependent yes. reality the world is not an independent reality to say that world has its own momentum through which it exists yeah. is a form of shirk is a form of idolatry right the world exists yeah. in so far as it is right. in existence by god so that is what i mean by a dependent reality Otherwise, we'll have two realities, right? One called God and one called the world, which is left to its own right. devices, which can usually do the stuff on its own. And on Friday, it remembers, okay, right. it's time for the Juma prayer. Okay, let's go there. Right? Mm -hmm. So that is shirk. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's right. what I'm saying. Yes. That if there right. is and course, I mean, there are, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, no, no, just go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yes, right. Yes, uh, Yes. Yeah, I, I was just mentioning that, you know, in, in your article itself, you uh, mentioned this, but uh, this, uh, you know, reminds me again of the Arabic word for world Okay. is alam. I see, yeah, yeah. Alam. When we say that, you know, God is the Lord of the world, it's Rabbul yeah. Alameen. Yes. Uh, its, its root is alama, meaning something which indicates or, or a sign. And I mean, the entire world is supposed to be an ayat or an indicator of God. So uh, when we see the world, we are supposed to see not the world, but God through it. Yes. Which is what the word, I mean, the alam signifies. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, to use a slightly uh, a technical word, right. diophanous. The world is diophanous insofar as everything is a signifier of the ultimate signified God. Right. So I look at a tree in the garden and I will see the leaves of the tree right. containing somehow, so the somehow that is to be worked out by the theologians, uh, containing somehow the signs of the divine presence. So even a leaf, or I should right. say especially a leaf, has that sign of God, that trace of God, that residue of God. So the debate is over whether this kind of language right. is to be viewed as idolatrous or not. That is the debate. So, so it is a conceptual, right. it's not a Hindu-Muslim debate. Right, of course, of course, right. Yes, so I mean, yeah, that is, uh, I mean, basically the uh, crux of, I mean, of our, of our discussion here. That, I mean, these uh, conceptual conundrums lie at the heart of all our traditions, not just of, you know, particularly. I mean, th these aren't challenges just for Hindus or just for Muslims, uh, but this is, uh, yeah, I mean, in one sense, you know, perennial uh, theological challenges which uh, all of these traditions deal with in various ways. Uh, Right. Yeah. Well, um, can we uh, talk a little bit about the process of darshan mm -hmm. and the symbolism of darshan? Yeah. Uh, of what is involved in seeing God and and in being seen uh, by God in, in that process of darshan. Yes. I think darshan is at the heart of many forms of lived Hinduism. You know, the what really keeps Hinduism going at the grassroots is this notion that somehow I can quote unquote see God and be seen by God. Right. So this direct immediacy of vision is is the the very lifeblood, you know, the, the, the living beating heart of many of these Hindu practices. And the, and the understanding is a bit like this, that um, if I go to see the image or the icon of Krishna or a certain Hindu god in a Hindu temple, this is not just a piece of stone. It is a what is a piece of stone in one sense, which has been ritually consecrated. And therefore, it is, let's say, semi-divinized matter. So to you and me, let's say, who may not be part of that Hindu Sampradaya, we go and say, oh, it's made of beautiful copper, which has been imported from Australia. That's how we may comment on the constitution of that idol or that image or that icon. But from the internal Hindu understanding of that Sampradaya, this is not just copper. It is not just metal. It is, as I say, semi-divinized, quasi-divinized, supercharged matter into which a divine spirit has been involved. So it is not mere matter anymore. And so if you touch it, of course, you will be able to touch a palpable, tangible object. I mean, your hands will not go through it. You will still touch copper or wood. 
But because it has been charged with its divine potentiality, has been awakened, has been activated. It is not just wood or copper or mud or earth anymore. And this has been done through um, a very complex ritual procedure, which is laid out in different manuals, right? You know, the, the person, let's say, will have to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and ritually consecrate it with different elements, like, let's say, milk or honey and so on. And once it's divine power has been awakened, it is not mere matter anymore. So this is the point, the paradoxical point of intersection between divinity and humanity or immanence and transcendence. So when a Hindu goes to see that image, they are not just seeing a material object. They are somehow being drawn into the spiritual field of the presence of divinity. So that whole temple, uh, if you look at it through the eyes of faith, you will not just see a material object made of stone. You will see surrounding it a spiritual field. And you are almost drawn into it through a kind of spiritual gravitation. And so long as you are within that field, let's say you are protected mm -hmm. by the grace, by the blessings, by the spiritual power of that spiritual field with the idol as a central axis. And therefore you offer fruit, flower, water, various kinds of offerings are made to the image to do what? To express your existential devotional subservience to the deity that, oh, great Lord of the three worlds, you are my master, you are my source, you are my refuge. And this is how I express my devotional humility, subservience to you. And the understanding is that when the vision, when the awakened sight of the image falls on that mango or the apple or the fruit, it again does not remain mere matter anymore. It's not just the apple you brought from Sainsbury's or uh, Re Reliance Fresh, to use the Indian example. So, so it, it is, say, quasi-divinized apple. So, so, so this is an apple whose material constitution has undergone almost a change in, in substance. So when you consume or ingest that apple, you are not just eating an ordinary fruit you happen to pick up from your neighbor's orchard. It is an apple which has been graced by the vision of divinity. And therefore you are ingesting. Now, how you want to put how you want to phrase the next sentence, which I'm going to phrase now, trying to phrase, depends on which sampradaya you are in. Some will be bold enough to say that when you eat that apple, you are somehow eating a part of divinity, that then you are becoming yourself semi-divinized, quasi-divinized. And some others will be more hesitant to use that language and say, no, no, don't think of it so materially, so literally. I mean, this charged apple with quasi-divine powers now is giving you some of its divine properties. So, so again, you can see the tension coming up even within a Hindu context. Like, do you want to go all the way and say that by eating the apple, which has been offered as puja, as adoration of the divine, as part of your darshan, you kind of become divine? Do you really want to say that? Some may say this. Some may say, no, no, don't talk like that. Say that a particle of divinity has now been awakened in you and has empowered you for your daily activities. And that's why many Hindus will go for the darshan when? Not in the evening, but in the morning, like before going to office or be, before being to God, even uh, be, be, before going to work, even if it is only for a five minute uh, offering or even three minutes, just to offer a, a salutation to the icon and feel that sacred power infuse their existential uh, filaments. And they are now, say, let's say, ready for the world, ready to return to the world, supercharged with this quasi divinized power. And this is the transaction between what in English we would call secular power and spiritual power. You become quasi-divinized with spiritual power to return to the world with all its complexities. Somebody's daughter has to get married. Somebody's uncle is in hospital. Somebody has to catch the train to go to Aligarh. Somebody has to deal with the election. Somebody has to do dot, 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 dot. The whole lightening of human ills and complexities. You are now ready to return to the world through that spiritual locus of five minutes, of three yeah. minutes, right? So, so this is why I say, I mean, darshan is what drives so much of Hindu practice at the on the ground, including including the darshan of the guru, for example. This is why the why seeing the guru, who is an embodiment, a living vehicle of the divine presence in some many Hindu sampradayas, is so important because the guru is not just you and me who is happening to talk about Hinduism and 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 Islam in this case. The guru somehow embodies and um, and both this, this, this uh, divine power, this divine presence, to some extent. Right. right. Well, yeah, I mean, 
this all you know uh, and this has of course fascinating parallels in the islamic tradition as well yeah yeah uh, what you're what you're terming the uh, you know quasi divine power or energy it's a, it, it sounds very similar to the concept of baraka in islam yes baraka or baraka baraka where, i mean this motion. spiritual right yes yeah of the murshid or i mean uh, not just of the murshid but i mean in general uh, yeah, yeah. so many things in life are uh, are you know uh, uh, considered imbued with this barka yeah. for example i mean as as you were mentioning when you go to the temple you get you know spiritually charged so uh, uh, similar experience can happen when you go to the mosque where i mean th there's something about about that space which is giving you or i mean which is which holds this spiritual energy or which uh, you know uh, embodies that spiritual energy in which which is being transmitted to your person and then you're carrying it uh, and of course i mean th there's the whole uh, uh, you know uh, sacred geography of the, you know various you know shrines as, as well as the the, the kaaba itself for muslims uh, and there there's of course i mean there there are certain times which are sacred which have their own you know spiritual energy uh, where your devotion is more uh, you know is you know more fruitful in that in that time yeah. as it were uh yeah that, that's I mean, a good so, I, mean, I mean sacred so, geography is a very nice ideas, yeah, provocative yes. Phrase. yes yeah right and, and 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 again what what i was trying to trying to indicate is this point of intersection yes. between something very material and something very physical and uh, something very and spiritual. So on the one hand, the, the offering is material. It's just a mango or an apple I buy from the local bazaar, right? I go into the I go into downtown Lucknow right. or Aligarh or Delhi and I buy a fruit. It's very material. There's nothing sacred or supernatural about it on the face of it. But once it has become absorbed or encompassed by the sacred geography or the spiritual field of the presence of the icon or the deity or the guru. It is, as I say, quasi semi divinized, so that you are now charged. Say, a, a Muslim may say, Oh, life is too much with me. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I'm half broken. And the Muslim goes to offer a prayer at the mosque. And the Muslim feels that there's some kind of direct communication has happened between a different dimension, different order of reality, which has intersected with their half broken human experience of sadness suffering and they come out of it feeling charged okay now i'm again ready to return to the world right so, so so this experience of withdrawing into oneself because we feel defeated and then withdrawing into one's true self which is let's say the divine self the divine power and being charged to return to the world this cyclical process is what you find in various forms of islamic subjectivity and various forms of hindu worship uh, at this point, maybe we can discuss what you had uh, mentioned in passing previously about uh, Ram Mohan Roy and the you know Brahmo Samaj and those kind of critiques of idolatry or of of sorry of image worship. Uh, so one concern which I have and which I'd, I'd, I'd like to understand better from you is uh, we find these these critiques emerging in modernity and perhaps in a certain you know uh, uh christian evangelical milieu as well uh so sorry a missionary context so uh, using that or you know uh, those those polemics or you know responding to, to those polemics in, in some way so are these critiques indigenous to the hindu tradition or i mean i mean firstly i mean that's one question are uh, do we have other examples of of certain pre-modern critiques of of these these concepts? Um, and uh, in this case, is the entire you know Ramohan Roy movement and all those things are they are they directly or or indirectly influenced by the Abrahamic uh, you know image or I mean, view of these things? Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh... Yeah. Various things can be said in response to your question, and I'm just quickly thinking um, on what note to start. Let, let me just start with a general comment, which is not about the question of idolatry or image worship. It's this question about the modern versus pre-modern rupture or division or split. 
Um, generally speaking, in my research, I work on, say, the last 1,200 years, 1,000 years. And what that means is that my research and my work spans the so-called modern, pre-modern distinction or divide. So, say, some people may work till, I mean, their research could focus on texts produced till about 1750, and some other people work on texts produced after 1850. But what I'm very interested in is this bridge, so to speak. What happens when somebody writing in 1820 in Hindi, Hindustani, or Bengali is reworking texts from 1650, right? I mean, do they go through some kind of a split, some kind of a uh, division? Now, um, that's just a, just a general comment about this, this modern, pre-modern uh, 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 distinction. Number two, I said it right at the beginning that a lot of my research is, in fact, not on Hindu-Muslim exchanges or uh, interactions, but even more so Hindu-Christian uh, exchanges and interactions for all kinds of reasons I won't go into. Now, the question of idolatry really becomes important in South Asia because of Christian missionaries. So from about, say, 1800 onwards, Christian missionaries who are arriving in South Asia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, today, and Nepal, they read Hinduism through this blanket category called idolatry. And you know, this, their understanding of idolatry is largely based on the Hebrew Bible, certain passages, certain uh, verses, the gods of the nations are idols and what they're seeing is a rank hedonism. And many, many, many of these Christian missionaries are simply not trained for the shock they feel. They're like, oh my God, this stuff was supposed to come to an end with the arrival of Christianity. The Greeks and the Romans, terrible people, they did this in the second century, first century common era, and the light of salvation came through the through Jesus Christ. It's over. What am I seeing in front of me? This is this terrible land of demons, right? So, because what you have to keep in mind is that these are young men, 18 years old, 21 years old, brought up in an entirely Christian nation. I'm talking about 1800, 1820. And when they arrive in South Asia and see people, Hindus, that is, worshipping so many different images, objects, sometimes trees, sometimes um, sometimes the river, they are not theologically trained at all to, to kind of understand what is the phenomenology behind these kinds of attitudes of veneration, reverence, adoration, worship. So the question does become a, a sharp flashpoint of controversy between Christian missionaries and Hindu reformers, apologists, intellectuals, social activists on the one hand, because of these conditions of modernity. So modernity, that blanket category called modernity, let's say it begins to develop in South Asia from 1800 onwards, does provide the context where debates over idolatry become extremely contentious. But the language in which many of these figures like Ram Mohan Roy, and various other figures, the language that they're using is not created overnight in 1850. It's not borrowed from uh, a certain verse in the Bible or a certain ayah or surah in the Quran. This tension between worshipping the divine reality through a form or affirming throughout that God is so utterly formless that no forms can be given is, as I was indicating in a previous answer, goes all the way back to the Upanishads and goes back to certain developments in Hindu theology around the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries of the common era, which predate the colonial encounters by about 800 years, 600 years. So let's say uh, the two key terms here are shaguna and nirguna. So guna is like a quality feature attribute, and nirguna is absolutely formless, and shaguna is having a form. So just to keep things very simple here, the Advaita commentator, exegete scholar Shankara, roughly the 8th century, says that Brahman, the divine reality, is absolutely, utterly formless. So that, paradoxically, I should not even say things like Brahman is utterly formless. The way to talk about Brahman is through an absolute, utter silence. But if I do that, you will be mystified, puzzled, perplexed. So I speak. As an accommodation to our human conditions of formed beings, we use the language of guna, qualities, forms, attributes. Whereas Ramanuja, and starting from Ramanuja, various other forms of bhakti movements in Western India, North India, South India, Ramanuja provides the theological underpinning for a way of speaking about the divine as having form, 
But subject to that caveat I pointed out earlier, that this form is not just a form of DNA, flesh and blood form. It's not just a form of human hair or like a human hand. It is a supernatural, supernatural form about which, again, I'm mystified, I'm puzzled. I can't tell you how it is that the form looks so human-like and yet not human. So this is a debate. It's a standard debate going on throughout many, many, many layers of Hindu ritual expression, Hindu mm -hmm. theological speculation, commentarial, um, you know, commentarial exegesis. Uh, at the very least from Shankara and Ramanuja, but Shankara and Ramanuja themselves are borrowing their language from where? From the Upanishads, from the Bhagavad Gita, from various other texts going back to the second century BCE. So to look at this debate that is happening in conditions of modernity in the time of the Brahma Samaj through a temporal telescope, you will see the theological commentator Shankara and Ramanuja, you will see the Bhagavad Gita, you will see the Upanishads, you may even see the Rig Veda, but in, let's not go that far back. Let's say at the very least, to study the critics of idolatry or image worship developed by the Brahma Samaj is to understand how these critics have a very long cultural theological history in the Hindu traditions, going back at least to, say, the Bhagavad Gita, possibly 200 BCE. Let's work with that date. Right. So a short answer to your question is modernity and Christian missionaries in particular provided the context where the question of idolatry became an extremely important, let's say, flashpoint of debate and controversy. But Christian missionaries or European observers did not provide the idioms for this, for this debate, or for, for the, the language that the Hindus like Ram Mohan Roy himself used. It's not borrowed from the Abrahamic tradition. It, it, it was... It was contained within the Upanishads and layers of commentaries on the Upanishads. The language would have been shaped and inflected, very deeply inflected. In fact, in the case of Ramon Roy, if you read the language of Ramon Roy, he speaks like a contemporary Victorian. It's beautiful Victorian English, he writes. The Almighty, that this, this, this. All these words are from the Hebrew Bible, uh, uh, King James Version of the uh, Bible, the, the New Testament. So the language is very much Christian, Christianized. But, but the very conceptual idiom is resonant with Christian missionary critique, but it is also coming out from his own readings of Shankara. Uh, he translates many of the um, he translates many of the Upanishads from Sanskrit to Bengali. Uh, Ram Mohan Roy. And so, right. Maybe I'll stop there for now. <laughs> right. 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 Yes. Uh, well, I mean, uh, this is just. Uh, a side point on this. Uh, I'm not. I'm not even sure about it, but perhaps you can confirm this. Uh, was there also a logical positivistic bent to this discourse in you know in the Brahma Samaj? Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. And I mean, perhaps yeah, perhaps I mean that, that might have been part of the reason why you wanted to get rid of certain you know uh, ostensibly uh, you know thick or heavy. Uh, you know, uh, images and go back to a kind of Protestant ideal of of how you know worship should be imagined. Yeah. Right. That's true. I mean, I mean, logical. I mean, positivist. That label may be a bit too early to apply to Ram Mohan. Right? Yeah. Right. Of course. Of course. But but in the spirit em of that, kind yeah. of right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I mean, again, this has powerful parallels, as you know, in in Islamic worldviews. This right between purism. Mm -hmm. And let's say even Puritanism, right. and uh, what we may right. call very gently folk Islam, you know, this whether mm -hmm. uh, God has multiple forms, like this form, that form, that form. I'm talking about the Hindu context. You go to this pilgrimage, you go to this temple, you have this guru, or is this absolute monotheism which does not allow any forms, the formless worship of the divine? This is being worked out in the Brahma Samaj, and. Partly, uh, you mentioned the term Protestant form of Hinduism, partly, as I said, a response to British Protestant Christian missionaries. Uh, most of these British mm -hmm. missionaries, to keep, we should keep in mind, were Protestant and not just Catholic. So right. Catholic missionaries would have a slightly more accommodating, could have a slightly more accommodating understanding of veneration of, uh, of images, because you know, it's part of Catholic practice also to venerate saints, not to worship saints. Uh, so when you say Protestant, mm. one should highlight that word. It is indeed a, a, a British right. Protestant, Protestant Christian anxiety about use of images. And um, yes, I would say so. I mean, that, you know, there's this, there's this attempt to purify Hinduism from the, its perceived excesses 
Uh, but but all I would add to that is that it is not as if the Protestant missionaries arrived in 1780 in Calcutta and set in train this motion. I mean, these reformers, mm. as we call them now, uh, or uh, uh, revivers, uh, they were going back to the Upanishads. They were going back to various pre-modern commentaries, just as many uh, the, the the Muslim version would be, say, people who go go on the Hajj pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia and realize, oh my God, this is the Quran. I mean, we have moved away, right? So, so that, that would be the Islamic parallel to this. Whether you go back to the Quran or go back to the Upanishad. Right. So the language of the Quran and the language of the Upanishads is, of course, not generated by modernity, right? I mean, that that, that tension has always predated right. the colonial encounters. What happens right. in colonial milieus is these reformers, as they're called, they realize, okay, there is a problem that we need to face and need to solve. Right, so. Right, right. Uh, yeah, fascinating. Right. Well, uh, uh, I suppose one one you know, final question for today uh, would be, uh, would be, when we're speaking about, you know, these parallels between Islam and Hinduism or Christianity, uh, there tends to be this general or, you know, commonplace binary which is propagated of Abrahamic versus Dharmic faiths. So is this uh, conceptual binary justified or is there any basis for that? I mean, you know, or I mean... Uh, how should we be thinking about this, right? Yes. Yeah, see, I mean, uh, I don't know how... Uh, uh, provocative you want me to be on this occasion, but, but let's say right. go with the provocation. <laughs> right, right. I don't know how many years now, must be at least 15 years. For at least 15 years now, I've been telling Muslims that from a theological point of view, and by theology here, I mean the logos of chaos, the understanding of who God is, how to work out the understanding of who God is by using human reason. Muslims are 50 times closer to Hindus than to Christians. Theologically, no mm. doctrine of original sin, original guilt, no mystery of incarnation, no notion of an atoning sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, the second son of the indivisible Trinity on the cross. And I can go on and on, like a whole train of doctrines, which will simply never come up in a Hindu-Muslim, this kind of an exchange about the meaning of God, about the significance of humanity. Now, again, I mean, that's why I highlight theologically. I mean, I mean, scripturally, mm -hmm. Jews, Christians, and right. Muslims, they share a common prophetic lineage. So if you ask me, right. where is Yunus in Upanishad? Okay, there is no Yunus, no, no Jonah. Where is uh, where is Adam mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita? Okay, not, not mentioned. Where is this prophet, Isa, or Jesus right. mentioned in the Puranas? Not mentioned. So there's not to deny, of course. I mean, I know why would I want to deny that? that? That culturally, historically, in terms of a shared understanding of a prophetic lineage, there are deep relations between um, Muslims, Christians, and uh, and Jews. And, and you know, for all the terrible things that Jews, Christians, and Muslims have done to one another, it's good that they have this label, right. if it promotes peace and mutual understanding. But one side right. effect, one negative effect of this binary, that, okay, we guys are Abrahamic, and those guys out there are Dharmic, is simply that the conversation that we are having, when I, when I, when I pointed out on one occasion, that this is not even a Hindu-Muslim problem, it's a conceptual problem. These conceptual similarities, complexities, paradoxes, tensions are not highlighted. They will say, okay, uh, Christians and Muslims do their own particular thing, and Hindus do their other thing out there, and these two domains are so compl completely mysterious, it does not facilitate proper understanding of the complexities, even within the so-called Abrahamic tradition, right? And I say, um, what what is the Abrahamic understanding of the idol? Suppose I ask this question to somebody who defends this, uh, this slogan, the Abrahamic tradition, right? And I say, okay, the Abrahamic tradition, what is the idol then? And and you say what will happen? Like what? Who, who, who mm -hmm. is on that? Yeah. So right. as a as a pedagogic device, maybe to get government funding for certain kinds of study, <laughs> maybe it's useful right. to go with that slogan, Dharmic faith versus Abrahamic faith. But when you actually study these conceptual formations, cosmological systems, you you see, I hope you will see what I said just now, that right. Muslims are 50 times closer to Hindus than to Christians. Again, this is not to say that Muslims should not engage with dialogue with Christians, of course, by all means do that. But not because they belong to an Abrahamic form. It's simply because we are human beings, finite beings, trying to work out understanding of divine with our finite resources. 
and uh, Christians and Muslims do share a prophetic lineage, so be it. But that doesn't mean that uh, theologically Hindus and Muslims don't share other things. Like they, they have, I mean, I think one of the reasons why there are so many of these so-called syncretic Indo-Islamic Hindu-Muslim milieus across South Asia is precisely for this reason, that Hindus and Muslims at the grassroots find it very easy to migrate in that way. I mean, whatever we may think about this migration, whether it is to be approved or not, is a different matter. But why is it that it happens so naturally? Because of all of this, right? You don't have to deal with this doctrine of the atonement, sacrificial death of Christ, mystery of the, of the incarnation, mystery of the Trinity. Comes, Christianity comes with the whole baggage of doctrine. None of this happens within, from a Hindu perspective, right? It's the singular, absolute unity of God. I mean... I know many, many Muslims would be shocked to hear what Hindus talk about the absolute unity of God. Mm -hmm. But but it's there in that verse I cited in the essay, is it not? The the Brihadaran mm -hmm. Upanishad, the Great Forest Upanishad, 800 BCE. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. so so the answer is yes and no. I mean, if it helps you to get government funding, okay, I will mm -hmm. I can live with it. But but I think it does more harm than mm -hmm. good to, to talk like this. The Abrahamic verses that harm me. Right, right. And I mean, uh, ultimately, it's only you're just essentializing and you're just creating uh, yeah. an unnecessary divide yeah. uh, towards towards mutual understanding and mutual engagement. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you don't, I, mean, I, mean, when, I mean, when right. uh, sorry, yeah, I mean, say when Hindu Muslim understanding does take place, and of course, I mean, there's a complex history behind this. Uh, when Hindu Muslim understanding right. has taken place, and even today, occasionally does take place, and we should keep on fostering it, you can see how this Abrahamic versus Dharmic binary is just artificial, right? I mean, do you think if there's a Mahfil or a Majlish where you invite Muslim intellectuals, Muslim theologians, Hindu thinkers to participate, they feel, oh my God, this powerful wall I have to cross now, the Abrahamic wall, how do I go to that Dharmic group like that? That's not how mm -hmm. Hindus and Muslims relate when they do relate in the best of times in mm -hmm. a place like Lucknow, Aligarh, Delhi, wherever, Gwalior. They just talk mm -hmm. about God, you know, and, and and that form of easy sociality is not impeded by this constructs called Abrahamic versus Dharmic. Right. You know I, mean? I mean, this is something that I feel very deeply about, as you can see, this, this, mm -hmm. this binary that has come up over the last 20 years, I would say. I mean, People did not talk like this earlier. Right, right, right. Yeah, and um, I, I also hope that our uh, conversation today also sheds some light on the fact that these uh, theological challenges or conundrums or paradoxes are uh, shared by our, you know, uh, different religions, uh, traditions, and uh, uh, many of these tensions and these reflections uh, are something which uh, we can all, uh, you know, benefit from from each other and uh, uh, get insight into our own traditions through the other's eyes, in that sense, right? Well, I, I think uh, it's been a fascinating conversation with you today, Professor. Uh, thank you for your time, and I hope we can uh, have another discussion soon, right? Yes, thank you, Sal, very much for for inviting me to. Thank you speak to you and ask me all these questions that have made me think reading that essay on the Sunday morning. <laughs>